Evening, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here. The aim of this evening is to pick up some nuggets to move forward, to get smarter, to start the process if you're the newbie. Don't panic about leaving today knowing everything. And the first question is, I mean, can you make money from trading? Absolutely, you can. Uh, is it easy? Yes and no. It, it's, it's easy in the sense that it's clicking some mouse buttons. It's not easy in that there's stuff to learn, as there always is with anything that we start. It's not easy in that there's a lot around psychology, fear, greed, emotions. Those certainly uh, make challenges. But to the short answer is, is it viable? Is it possible? Can it be done whilst still having a job, not having to be you know, full time and watching markets 10 hours a day? Yes. Are you going to be a trader at the end of this presentation? No but you will be better schooled and better placed to grow and become one in time. So set those parameters right up front uh, and then you can lose more than you start with. And this is an important point and it depends what you're going to be trading, most notably derivatives, which is borrowed money. So we've got to trade carefully here, but there's simple ways we can avoid that concern. But then the quote from Van Kaythorp, and this is so hugely important and, and it comes back to the psychology that I talk about. We don't trade the markets, we trade our beliefs about the markets. And, you know, if, if, if you have a, a set belief, you're gonna, that's going to work its way into what you trade. What's critically important when we trade is that we trade what is in front of us, not what we think should be happening, not what we think is right. It's what we see in front of us. And that's a, a difficult part of the whole process to get to that point where it really is, well, I might believe something else. I might be completely flummoxed by what I'm seeing, but the reality is what I see in front of us is what I'm going to trade. We've got to understand our relationship to the market as much as anything else. We're going to come back to that and a whole bunch. And in fact, psychology in of itself, we can do multiple sessions on that, uh, all of them an hour long plus more. So firstly, is trading risky? Well, of course it is risky. I mean, any yeah, cash under your mattress is like the only really safe thing except for three problems. Inflation, your house burns down, the kids find it. You venture out to make a profit, start a business, invest, trade, there's going to be risk. But let's define risk, the chance that actual return will be different than expected. In other words, you go into a position and you expect to make 100 bucks but instead you, you lose 50. Well, that's risk. Or maybe you only make 50. That's still risk. It's that difference in what you expect versus the outcome, which means we need to understand what we can control in the market. What we control in the market is not how much money we will make in an individual trade. What we can contr control is our response. We can control our process. Those are the important things that we do control. Mark Douglas, and I encourage you, and I'll have a list of books at the end of the presentation to go and hunt down. I encourage you to go and read Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone. When you genuinely accept the risk, you'll be at peace with any outcome. And that's the key thing is understanding that, yeah, in an individual trade, this trade, you might lose money but it's over the collection of trades that absolutely matters and how we respond to it. Again, our responses to those losing money. So let's look at the, some of the processes behind it. The, the first question is, I'll start here because I know what happens. We start trading, uh, we get an app, website, whatever, we sign up with a broker, we've got hundreds of products, nay, thousands of products and real-time pricing and suddenly we're spending six hours a day, eight hours a day, and we want to be a day trader, and we want to make trades that are a minute long or something like that. Point with intraday trading is that if you've got a job and you're intraday trading, you're going to lose money and your job. What you need to do with your trading is find that time. And, and one of the beauties of trading, you know the cliche, you can trade from anywhere with an internet connection. You absolutely can. You can also trade whenever. You know, I know some folks who trade the, the US markets because that's happening in the evenings. And that's fine, family dependent and you know, enough sleep and the like, but that's their strategy to not letting it get in the way of their of their day-to-day -day job. You can also trade daily charts. You can trade weekly charts. We don't need to be watching the market every second, every minute. I trade on daily chart, which means I only care about the close and what happens intraday is neither here nor there. Now, I'm watching the market because it's what I do. It's my job. It's how I do radio shows and podcasts and everything else. But that's not about my trading. In an ideal world, I call myself a lazy trader. In an ideal world, my trading takes me half an hour a week. Five minutes a day, Monday to Friday, 
and five minutes on a weekend to do a recap. Nice, simple, not getting in the way of my life. I don't want to be a day trader because that's just another, truthfully, stressful and tiring job. That's not what I'm looking. I'm looking for that cliche, freedom from ties that bind, not spending my days staring in front of a screen and basically being a full-time trader. That's not my ideal by any stretch of imagination. So that brings us to the trading matrix. This is something uh, when I was running SA Warrants with Manfred Harbeck, we put together. So this is probably 20 years old. The various different components that we need in order to have success. And I'm going to go through each of them in detail so we can spend some time there. We need to have goals. We need to have discipline. We need to have money management, which is risk, which is stop loss. We need to have the resources and we need to have a system that tells you what to buy, when to buy, what to sell, when to sell, and basically the rules around it. And we need all of those to come together at strong levels. If you're weak on one of them, it will collapse the whole process. We need all five of those, goals, discipline, money management, resources, and a system. When we've got all five of those, then we can start being a successful trader. There are more steps beyond that, but that is what we first need to get to. We need to focus on what our goals are. We need to understand the importance of discipline and practice it. We need massively good money management. We need the resources, relatively simple. We need a system, again, not half as complicated as I think many of us expect. So those are the five things. Let's go through each of those and understand them all in a little more detail. Goals. The first thing about goals is make them bite size. Don't be sitting here this evening and say, yeah, well, my goal from trading is easy. I want to make a million rand a year. That might well truthfully be your goal, but that is your long-term goal. How do you get to that long-term goal? Well, bite-sized pieces. In other words, what's the first step of getting to the point where you can make a million bucks a year or 100,000 or 1,000 or whatever it is per year trading? Well, the first step is this presentation. The second step will be some homework that I'll give you at the end of this evening. The third step is going and reading some of the books I'll give this evening as well, attending more courses, have those goals. So when you leave here this evening is, cool, there's some homework to do. First goal, let's go and do that homework. Let's find those books that I spoke about. Make those goals bite signs that ultimately lead you to that big goal. They've got to be achievable in the immediate, in the short term. And one of the key goals is perfect trades. And I'm going to talk more about that in a moment so we can park that there. But it's going to be setting time aside every day, perhaps over the weekends, whatever the case may be. And this is around engaging with the people who are significant in your life, your family, your loved ones, uh, uh, friends, etc. You know, Saturday mornings, maybe you say, look, I'm going to spend three hours on Saturday mornings you know, placing stop losses and see how they're doing. Okay, but now you've got to do that on Saturday mornings, which means no shopping, which means no, you know, mimosas with, with friends or whatever the case may be. You've got to make those goals and you've got to communicate them with your, with your circle of, of, of friends, family, uh, colleagues and the like so that they become achievable. And then you need to be constantly measuring against those goals. Am I achieving? Write the goals down. The end of this evening, half past six, first goal, maybe half past six, not convenient for dinner, whatever the case is. Put aside yourself half an hour over the next day or three where you will write down those goals to get you to become that trader. And then you can tick them off. And you also get that affirmation. As we achieve these goals, there's a sense of, hey, I'm moving forward. Because whenever we've got a long-term goal, often it feels like we're not moving forward. It feels like we're stuck. It feels like we're going backwards. And truthfully, in some places, we probably are stuck or going backwards. But there are others where we're not. And that then also starts to create habits. And habits creates discipline, and discipline is hugely important. I mentioned a perfect trade. I mentioned right up front that what we're looking at is our relation to the market and how we respond to losses and what how we measure risk and understand risk. Every time I do a trade, I go and score it, essentially, out of seven, and that is the seven points that I use. Now, and you can't quite see the link, but if you go to justonelap.com, search perfect trade, you'll find there's a 30-minute video on the whole process. And I've got those seven, and you're welcome to grab them. You're welcome to change them and adjust them. What you notice is not there, profit or loss, because that's beyond my control. I'm measuring myself on what I can control. Did I get the signal, confirmation, position size, stop loss, monitoring the trade, adjusting stop loss, and exiting as per, as per the system? 
Those are the things I can control. I can do all of that perfect. And that trade might not make me money. I might get stopped out and have a small loss. But this has got to be one of your goals is to do one perfect trade. And when you've done a perfect trade, brilliant, congratulations. Next step, two perfect trades. And don't say you want to do 100 perfect trades. No, start with one. Why? Because it's achievable. And although that looks so incredibly simple, having been you know, talking around the perfect trade for more than a decade, I can tell you that it is hard to do. And you're looking at that list and thinking, there is nothing that's hard on that. I know there isn't. But the market is shouting at you. Your FOMO is shouting at you. Your fear and greed is shouting at you. And that's what makes that what looks deadly simple on paper immensely difficult. Perfect trade. Target is one. And then it's two. And then eventually you get to 100. And one day you're at 311 and you're the Hashem Amla of perfect trades. Discipline. So the perfect trades help with my discipline. They help with my discipline because I've got a process that I know that I follow. I know what I need to do. I know what I'm looking for my charts. And that then comes to that discipline. And keep notes, lots of notes. Keep a trading journal. You can find an online one. You can use an Excel spreadsheet. There are even some companies out of the UK who do these beautiful hardcover dead tree books for your, for your trading journal. And keep notes. Keeping notes. It helps you learn and improve. It helps you understand where you might be going wrong. It helps you see where you are improving. It also helps you see where you might have found mistakes, errors, bad habits creeping into your trading. Lots of note taking. And part of that note taking is recording that perfect trade and making sure that you're fully on board with what the perfect trade is and that you are achieving it. That is incredibly important. <clears throat> consistency of action, consistency of mind, discipline of the mind. The point with trading is that, let's say you, you, you find yourself in a spot, you're doing perfect trades, you're making some cash with the trading. What matters then is that it's consistent. Why? So it's repeatable. If you just randomly wake up in the morning, turn on the radio, and the first stock you hear mentioned or first thing you see on Twitter, you respond to. Is that replicatable the next day and the day after and the day after? Short answer is no. You've got to have something which you can repeat again and again and again. And once you find what works, you need to have that discipline to stick to it so that it can continue to work and that you can benefit and profit from it. And that's hugely important. When I say to when I when I speak to successful traders, and there are many successful South African traders out there, and you ask them what's one of the key points to their success, discipline is the word that they use. It's discipline, it's process that is so hugely important. And then risk management. Trading is risk. Sure. We spoke up front how I measure risk when the when the expectation is different. And if my expectation is a perfect trade, well then it's actually my risk is quite low because I'm in complete and utter control in that. But let's park that for now. And I'm going to come back to a bunch of these points. So if they're not making sense, that's fine. We'll come to them in time. The first is position size. One of the big mistakes people make with risk management is that they do trade sizes that are simply too large. They're simply too large for the portfolio. They're too large for their emotion. And I know why. You've got this brilliant winning trade. And you want to go as big as you can because it's going to make you a fortune and you don't want to make only a small amount of money. I, my best investment ever was Capitec, 20 rand a share, went to 2,000, I think 600 was, was, was the, 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 the peak. What's that? 130 bagger. If I had taken everything I owned and stuck it in at, at, at 20 and rode it the whole way, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be in my island somewhere. But what if it had been Steinhoff instead? Which means I wouldn't be here, I'd be working at the local McDonald's. It's around keeping the position sizes manageable and real. Stop loss is hugely important. When you get into a trade, you've got two places you're going to exit. One is up here when the trade runs in your favor, but the other is you're saying that this is going to go higher. Well, if it's not going higher, it's going lower, which means you are wrong. What's the best thing to do when you're wrong? Get out. Stop loss. The stop loss tells you how to identify when you're wrong and when to get out. And that is hugely important. Otherwise, today, it's not just that you bought Steinhoff with everything. It's that you still hold Steinhoff 
at 25 cents instead of selling way back in 2017 at 25 rand. So stop losses are hugely important. They're difficult, right? What's difficult about them? First thing is, most times, your stop loss loses your money. You bought the share at 10 Rand, the stop loss was 9 Rand, bang, you exit at 9, you've lost money. That's not what you're trying to do. But was it a perfect trade? That's the key point. The second thing why stop losses are hard is because they're telling us that we're wrong. Well, yes, but no one can predict the market with any level of certainty. That's just not going to happen. If you're defining you get into a position and it goes down instead of up as wrong, you're in for a rough ride. goes back to my perfect trade. What can you manage? What is in your control? Because you will get into a position and you will expect you know, with absolute certainty that it's going to go in your favor and something will happen. You're wrong. War breaks out. Who knows what the story is? And then suddenly you find yourself on the other side. Stop loss and position size, neither is hard, in theory, on paper, <clears throat> but both are emotionally taxing. And it comes back to that emotional. But without them, I can promise you, if you don't do good position size and if you don't use a proper stop loss, you will go bust. That is absolutely the certainty. <clears throat> Resources. What do you need to trade? Truthfully, you need very little. You need a computer, a phone with internet access, nothing fancy. You don't need the top of the range laptop. You don't need an iPhone, what's it, 14 or a Samsung S, what, 23, whatever. Yeah, you just need a decent smartphone. You need a computer. You need internet access. Uh, become an expert on the demo account. Find yourself a broker. Now, you're going to say, which broker? There are hundreds. Don't go and scout around and find some dodgy broker that no one's ever heard of. There are enough registered in South Africa by the FSCA to meet all your needs. If you want an offshore broker, there are a couple of the big ones there. You don't need to go and find some broker no one's heard of. You don't need to find a broker that's you know, registered in the Seychelles or Malta or anything like that. You want them registered with recognized uh, authorities. If you find a broker that says there is no fee, well, there is a fee. But if they say there isn't, then what is that fee? If you find a broker that offers the most exotic products, why do you want to trade exotic? Why do you want to trade orange juice futures? For what? No, man, keep it simple. You know, see what your bank's got. As I said, there are tons of them locally. Uh, they were great. But find a broker, sign up for it, and become an expert on that demo account. Because the demo account is boring. I get you but it's teaching you how to use the system. You don't want to be frantically learning how to place a stop loss or close a trade when you've got real money on the line. And then capital to trade. The short answer, and this is not a fun answer, is you can't start trading with too small amount of money. You can get away with 10,000 Rand in some cases, and I stress the sum. Ideally, you want 20,000 Zard to start trading. And I know you're thinking, yo, if you had 20,000 Zar, you wouldn't be here right now. You'd be out there balling it up on the Thursday evening. Fair enough. Here's another one of your goals. Get some money together. If you want to be trading CFDs, which is where most people start, you probably need 35 or 50,000, probably ideally 100. And that's so you can, A, absorb the costs, and B, do proper risk management. Think about it. If you start with 1,000 Rand and cost a transaction, <clears throat> they tell you it's 0.2%, but the minimum is 100 Rand. Well, okay, so it's 100 Rand to buy and it's 100 Rand to sell. That's 200 bucks to get in and out. You had 1,000 Rand. So your 1,000 Rand after buying and selling is 800 Rand. You have lost 20% of your money only on the costs, cost of transaction. You go trade in Ormi, which is a, a futures contract uh, by Safex, cost of transaction, 15 Rand to buy, 15 Rand to sell. Well, hang on a second. Now with your 10,000 Rand, you're spending 30 Rand to get in and out. The numbers start to make sense. You see what I mean around you simply, if you start with too small, you might get lucky. And sure, there are stories about it. TikTok is full of them. But don't, don't, don't make luck your plan. That is not a, a viable solution by any stretch. <clears throat> and then you need a trading system. Your system is your process. It needs to be a rigid process. It needs to have rules in place. Now, we'll come back to those rules in a moment, but the first thing is whose rules and what rules? Well, anything you want. I mean, that's part of the trick. Now, you can do technical analysis, which is only looking at the charts, and you simply don't care about anything else. 
You can trade the news. Every time there's a big news event, today we had the, the MPC Saab raise rates half a percent and the RAND crashed out. You can trade news events. You can trade uh, non-farm payrolls in the US. And you don't need to look at what the data is. You look at the price action and you trade price action. In other words, you watch what the, what, what the, what the market is telling you. Yeah, how do you know if a market liked results or not? Do you need to read the results? No, you look at what the price is doing. How do you know if, the, if currency traders believe the Saab's idea around inflation? Well, you look what happened to the RAND. So you can do pure technicals. You can trade news. You can do fundamentals. I like to predominantly, most of my trading, index trading, pure technicals. Two moving averages, nice and simple. That's what I trade. On what I call my second tier stocks, I'm finding a stock that I like from the fundamentals. I'm looking for a technical picture that confirms it, i.e. the chart. So I've got fundamentals and then I've got chart. And when, when the fundamentals say you want to buy it and the chart gives me a buy signal, then I enter. So there's an infinite way of doing this. And I suppose the first point is, how do we define a trade? Well, I use uh, SARS definition, anything less than three years. If you buy and you expect to sell within a three-year period, you are trading. And how you design that system needs to be something that makes sense for you, something that you're able to manage, and something that you're comfortable with. Some people just aren't comfortable with the idea of only using a chart, technical analysis. They're like, no, man, can't do that. That's completely and absolutely crazy. Okay, fair enough. Then bring some fundamentalism. Find what works for you. And then ultimately, good trading is boring. I say to folks, if you're having fun trading, you're probably losing money. Good trading ultimately is it's repetition. It's process. It's rules-based. It's perfect trades. It's not like they show it in the movies, Gordon Gecko or Wolf of Wall Street or any of the others. Good trading is boring because you're simply following process. And that's partly why you don't want to be a full-time day trader. Because it's boring, and then huge amounts of stress, and then you know, 12 hours a day. No fun to that whatsoever. So your system tells you what to do, what to buy, when to sell. Keeps you honest, stops wild hope and pray trades, and it gives you that consistency, which is so very, very important. The system is critical. Now, you're going to say, well, where do I start with the system? I mean, so... I, as I said, I do pure mechanical. It removes me from the process. Understand complexity does not equal a better system. You, know, you look at a, a, a technical analysis package. You log on to a demo account. You load up the chart. and You look at indicators and oscillators and trend lines. And there are hundreds of them. And, and they're weird, wonderful ones. There's Fibonacci lines. There's GAN. There's all of these wild and crazy. And we think somewhere in here is the answer. I can tell you now it's not. A colleague of mine once overlaid the the moon on the moon, phases of the moon on a gold fields chart. And I promise you, for the preceding three or four years, if you had just traded the phases of the moon in gold fields, you made money. Is that a system? It could be, but certainly I'm not going to be trusting that. Not, not at all. Don't chase complexity. Chase simplicity. Why? Because complexity doesn't make for better. Complexity puts more space for error. Simplicity keeps it nice and simple. Go look at chart patterns, learn reversal patterns, MO, M, moving average crossovers, breakouts, etc. Have a look, decide what works best for you, decide what you like. In my sort of second tier, what am I looking for? A good piece of fundamentals. What do I then look for? A nice break. Go look at the Roy Net chart. Go look at the Colgo M3 chart. Go look at the uh, uh, Sun International chart from a little while ago. Uh, 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 City Lodge. All of those sort of charts, you can see, you can make the argument for the fundamentals and then you see, bang, now it's, now it's broken up, now it's going higher. Don't go and say to yourself, the fundamentals are great and I'll buy it, but the price is going down. No, carry on, wait for the price to start going higher. Buy things that are going in the direction you want them to. You want that wind at your back. In other words, you want the stock already going up. Then you jump on the bus. You're never going to get perfect at the bottom. You're never going to get out perfect at the top. You want what Mark Douglas refers to as the bit in the middle. And that bit in the middle is plenty enough, absolutely plenty enough. So go and learn chart patterns. Go and dig around there and then build something that works. But simplicity, 
not complexity. And here is, this is my 721. I use this for trading uh, indices. It's the 721 moving average crossover with confirmation the next day. This goes back, this is a daily chart, goes back to November, and the red arrows are where I buy. So I've had uh, two trades made good profit. Uh, one trade was a break even, this first one, and one trade, this one here, cost me some cash. And that's it. I've done four trades. This is the NASDAQ. I've done four trades since November. We call that in half a year, which is actually a slightly busy year for me. What I also don't do. So in trading, we can go long. We can go short. Going long is making money on the upside. You buy something with the expectation it will go higher. But in trading, you can also go short. You can sell something with the expectation it will go lower and you buy it back. I don't do short trades. I just don't do them. Why? Because they're far too violent. They're far too volatile. The thing collapses, bounces, you stopped out, then it collapses further. Over 20 plus years of, of profitable trading, I've just learned I don't do short trades. Just not for me. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you only want to do shorts. Maybe you're not interested in, in uh, doing uh, uh, the long side trade. But again, hit the chart to confirm. You know, there's a chap on Twitter who, who, who's been uh, uh, railing against Capitech for over a decade. Biggest short in the world, he says. Maybe he's right. But at this point, unless he shorted it just, you know, if he had shorted it 10 years ago, he's still thousands of percent underwater. Wait for the both to sync up, particularly on the short side. And that chart, remember I said earlier up that it's, uh, what, 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 what we think about the market matters so much. And that's where the fundamentals can really sort of hook us in. Whereas when we're looking at price action, you know, there's one truth in the market, one truth in the market. The price is right. You might not like it, but it's true. That price is true. Why? Because someone bought and sold whatever it was at that price. That is a true statement of fact. I buy the NASDAQ. I buy it. Someone sells it. That is a true statement of fact. My expectation of where it will go the seller's expectation of where it will go. Those are not fact. Those are opinion. The level of valuation, whether it's expensive or cheap, again, those aren't fact. Those are opinion, which is why I like price data and why I like to have as little as possible on my chart, keeping it simple, very, very simple. So next Touch on Maslow. We've gone through the trading matrix. I want to touch on Maslow. You all know Maslow from Hierarchy of Needs. He did a bunch of stuff. And I want to talk around this concept of consciousness and competence. So whenever we learn something new, we start at the point of unconscious incompetence. You're useless. You're unaware of that fact. You lose money and you wonder why. Now, truthfully, no one in this audience is at that point of, of, of being. Quite simply, how do I know that? Well, if you were useless and unaware of it, you wouldn't be here this evening. But that is the first step. And then slowly, we start to get a little bit smarter. We start to investigate the stop lossy thing. We start to be cleverer with our charts. Maybe we bring a little bit of fundamentals in, whatever the case is, and we become consciously incompetent. You realize there's more to trading? You realize you're not quite there yet. And usually what we do at this point is we bring in complexity. We try and make things as complicated as possible and we bring that complexity into the equation. Problem is we're still not making money because of that complexity. We don't have levels of discipline. And the next stage then becomes consciously competent. You start to realize that simplicity is what matters. Trading becomes less scary to you. The profits start to flow, but you still get bad trades. You still make bad decisions from time to time. You still make uh, uh, sort of gut decisions to either buy or sell something, to enter a trade, to, to exit a trade. You break the rules. You're not doing perfect trades. And ultimately, what we're trying to achieve is unconscious competence. And unconscious competence sounds weird, but think about driving. Think about the first time you were driving with a clutch and a brake and an accelerator probably stalled the car a couple of times. There was a lot to think about there. And heck, you weren't even worrying yet about indicators and parking and all of that sort of stuff. Now when you drive, think about the last journey you did, wherever you were driving to or from. 
If you try and detail that entire journey, there'll be bits where you just can't quite remember. You know you went through that intersection because it's how you get from A to B. You don't quite remember the intersection. Why? Because you were doing it unconsciously yet competently. It becomes second nature to you. And that's what we got to get our trading to. Trading becomes boring. It's just second nature. You just saw me do it. You, you, you open up your app in the morning. I see, ah, oh, there's a buy on the NASDAQ. Cool, work out my position size. Click, click, buy it, close the app, carry on with my day. Don't even think about it until the next morning. What do I do? Well, I open up my app again. Have a look, see. Right, so how's the NASDAQ doing? Is there anything else I've got to be trading? And it just becomes that second nature. It becomes like driving a car after many, many years. Unconsciously competent. That's a boat from Soldana. That's Soldana Harbor. Um, there we go. So then the question comes, what to trade? So top of pile, where most people start, shares or CFDs. Let's quickly pause a little bit on CFDs. They are a derivative. So if you trade shares, what do you do? You go to the market, the shares 10 Rand, you pay 10 Rand, you now own the share. You get dividends, you get invited to AGMs. That's not the part of trading. You own the share, you buy it at 10, it goes to 20, you sell it, you make money. It goes to 9, you sell it, you lose a little bit of money. CFDs, which is what trading is, what derivatives are. You get a 10 Rand share, but you only pay 1 Rand or 2 Rand. And that seems deeply attractive. Hmm. 10 Rand share, but I'm only paying 2 Rand. Effectively, my broker is loaning me the other 8 Rand which means I can buy five shares instead of just one. So if it goes to 20, instead of just making 10 bucks, I make 50 bucks. Who doesn't want that? Well, because if it goes to nine rand, instead of losing one rand, you've lost five rand and you're 50% down. You know, 10 rand's been decimated. Leverage seems great, but it is not necessary. Some of the best traders I know, some of the folks on Twitter, they trade without leverage. They just buy the share or the ETF, or the index. Nice and simple, no leverage required. Problem with shares is single event risk and high volatility. If you were in the wrong side of transaction capital when that horror trading update came out, all the results, if you were in the wrong side of Steinhoff, Tongard, the list is huge. If you were the wrong side of the, or, or, you know, shares are single event risk. And I don't like single event risk. As I said, I would do them in my second tier portfolio, and I certainly don't do them yet, but they are high volatility. Volat volatility. Crypto. Crypto is just Wild West 24-7 trading. You're going to get stopped out at 2 o'clock in the morning or something crazy. Sure, you can trade crypto. Truthfully, if you want crypto, buy some small position in your portfolio, put it in your own hardware wallet. Do not leave it on exchange. And then some would just forget about it. Commodities, I intuitively like the idea of trading commodities, but the the the, the big commodities, right? The the PGMs, not so much rhodium, but platinum, palladium, gold, oil. But you know, orange juice, lumber, go find the, the crazy commodities. No, that that's that's not a great idea. Keep the commodities simple, keep it on the really big ones, make sure you know what the T's and C's are. Indices or ETFs. So an index is just a basket of shares, and an ETF is just a way that you trade that basket on exchange. This is my preferred. It is gentle volatility. You know, a, a big day for an index is 2%, maybe 3%. Big day for a share is, NVIDIA went up, what, 30% today. You know, uh, 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 transaction capital has, has lost 30% in a day twice since that trading update in March. Indices are nice. You can get into the position. You can trade it nice and simple. You can ride that trend. Look at this picture here of NASDAQ. Nice trend from, what's that? Uh, call it mid-March. Nice trend. It's rallied up 200 odd points. That's about 15% in two months. Nice and simple. That nice run up there at the beginning of the year from early January into uh, mid-Feb. Start with indices. Currencies, so everyone wants to be an FX trader. <clears throat> if you're going to trade FX, yes, there's low volatility. Only trade the majors. Dollar, euro, yen, sterling. That's it. Only trade the majors and their respective crosses. 
The trick with currency is a couple of problems. Firstly, they are very low volatile, but then some broker is going to offer you 100 or 500 times gearing, which means your 10 Rand is now 1,000 Rand. Uh, that's nice, but if it moves that much against you, you've got no money left. You basically bust out. The other thing is where do the pro traders go? When JP Morgan hires a new bunch of traders and they give them $100 million, what do they tell them to trade? FX. So where do you start? Start with shares, not CFDs. Start with indices or ETFs. A lot of brokers will let you trade indices. You know, you want to trade the S&P. You can trade that on the JSC or you can open an account offshore and trade the VOO, which is the ETF on the S&P. Spreads are tight, costs are low, and you get those movements. That NASDAQ trader showed you a moment ago, it's 15% in, what's it, two months? Six weeks, two months, no, a little over two months, 15%. Nice, simple, easy. We don't need gearing. And I know what you're saying. Okay, 15% in two months. But imagine if I had 10 times gearing, it'd be 150%. Well, sure, but imagine if you were on the wrong side of the COVID crash or the flash crash of, 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 of what was it, 2015, whatever. I mean, yes, what we're doing is we're saying, well, we want gearing because we're looking at the bright side. But what happens when there's not a bright side? And maybe in time you start gearing, you, you get to it, but you don't start with it. You start ungeared. You start with shares. You start with ETFs or indices. Uh, ETFs or indices. Nice, simple, vanilla, no real pain points. Not without risk, but markedly less risk. No borrowed money. Remember when you're borrowing money as well as you're paying interest on that, hey? And at this point in time, with high interest rates around the world, there's that daily cost of a CFD that eats into your profits. When to trade? As I said, we start off watching intraday prices. You lose money, you lose your job. Day trading is a job. Maybe that's what you want to do, but learn to do it first. You know, trading is like anything else. If you wanted to be a rocket scientist or a plumber or anywhere in between, what's the first thing you're going to do? Learn the skills. Trading's no different. Are you going to learn those skills in a weekend? Not a chance. You're going to learn it over time? Baby steps? Starting simple? Sure. Long-term charts are easier, less stressful. Start with daily charts, even weekly charts. Well, Elder takes what he calls the three-step process. So he gets a buy signal in the weekly chart. Then he goes to a daily chart and gets a buy, waits for the buy signal. And then he goes to the hourly chart. When he gets the buy signal there, he buys. So when I'm trading my indices, I'm looking at daily charts. When I'm trading shares, I'm looking at, at, at weekly charts. So I'm only doing those transactions either in the closing auction on a Friday or the opening auction on a Monday. Weekly charts. Tells you more information. Gives you more time. Makes you less stressed. The other thing is that shorter trades mean smaller profit, more slippage, Costs are the same. Let's say that whatever it is you're trading, you're, you're, you're paying 100 bucks in terms of costs. But if you're profit, if you're doing a short, quick trade and you just want to pop it up higher and you're going to grab it and you're going to make 150 bucks, but costs is 100, so you've only made 50. You've got a longer time for your trade. Still a 100 buck cost to buy and sell. But you hold that share over the course of maybe a year or two. I held my Sun Internationals uh, almost two years I held them. 70% return plus dividends, probably close to 80% at the end of the day. Ungeared. Transaction, well, I paid my 0.25 at the beginning. I paid my 0.25 at the end. Absolutely the same. So longer time frame just makes it easier. And maybe in time you become a FX scalper trading the tech chart. Sure, but don't start there. Don't start at the pointy end. Start at the easy, safer end. Important that I've been speaking around technical analysis. It's not an edge. It's not meant to be complicated. It's not a, it's not a holy grail. And I repeat this because it's so very important as to what it is. Price is truth and price action is where you see it on the chart. So if you're going to use some technical analysis and some charting in your trading, you need to get a fake. And I've done it all. I've done the head and shoulders. I've done the chart patterns, reversal patterns, so I can see them on the chart. But I'm not trading them. 
because I've got my process. I've got what I'm looking for, and that's what I'm going to trade. I'm not going to suddenly say, well, hang on, uh, th that's a, a, a engulfing candle. That's a reversal pattern. Time to buy. No, that's not part of my process. I recognize it. I see it, but I don't act on it because it's not something that I necessarily cares for. So let's get more to risk. Stop losses, 2% rules. We're going to get some, some complexity here. Don't matter. We are recording this video. You can go catch it. It'll be online in a couple of hours. Uh, just one lap.com slash power hour. You can go and find it there. You can rewatch this. There are other videos that go into a lot more detail as well. I touched on this about 20 odd minutes ago and I come back to it. The 2% rule. In any one trade, you risk 2% of your portfolio. 2% of your portfolio. So you keep it really small. What that means, it, let's pretend that it's uh, linear uh, rather than logarithmic. And I know that the math people out there are saying, no, no. It, what it means is if you're risking 2% per trade, you need to do 50 losing trades in a row to b go bankrupt. 50, 5 zero losing trades in a row to go bankrupt. That is unlikely, even for a novice. So, the problem is 2% rule doesn't work with a small portfolio. And that's what I came back to earlier. So let's touch on it. So it's the amount you're prepared to lose per trade. So if you've got a 10,000 Rand portfolio, 2% is 200 bucks. If you've got a 50,000 Rand portfolio, 2% is 1,000 bucks. First question, how do you feel about losing that money? Because it's going to happen often. My trading on my uh, uh, index trading, I'm right about half the time. But when I'm right, I make 500 bucks. And when I'm wrong, I lose 200 bucks. So I'm ahead of the curve. How do you feel about losing that money? Are you comfortable with it? This is not your kid's school fees or something like that. That's an important point. This is something where you're saying, I can manage this. I can do this. I can be okay with this. You've got to be psychologically and emotionally prepared to lose that bit of money. But again, you've got a 50,000 Rand portfolio, you're risking 1,000 Rand per trade, you've got to do 50 trades that go wrong before you're totally out. So how does the 2% work? So let's look at a 20,000 Rand portfolio, 2% of that is 400 Rand. So you're buying the share at 10 Rand. When you buy a share, you say to yourself, I'm buying it at 10 Rand, where's my stop loss? What is the price at which I will exit, no questions asked, because I am wrong? In this case, you've looked at the chart and you said my stop loss is 9 Rand. Your stop loss is actually 10% in this case. Don't confuse the 2% rule with a 2% stop loss. The stop loss here is 10 Rand. Quick aside on this. When people tra trade equity, they simply put their stop loss too close. Equity is volatile. Now, Chapa recently, he took a position on one of the banks. The stop loss was 3%. Now, that bank had a, 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 an average true range, an ATR of four and a half percent his stop loss needed to be two times atr ten percent and that's what i got there i bought at 10 rand my stop loss is nine rand so if i buy at 10 and i sell at nine because i'm stopped tight i've lost one rand so my risk per share is one rand i divide that into the 400 rand which is my two percent i can buy 400 shares now that's going to cost me 400 shares at 10 rand it's going to cost me four grand if they fall to nine rand, I exit, I sell them, and I've lost myself 400 rand, and my portfolio is now 19,600. A losing trade, and I hardly even notice. If I'd taken the entire portfolio at 20,000 and bought shares at 10 rand, and they dropped to nine rand, well, now I've only got hmm, 18,000 left. And then I do that again, and I've got 16, 14, 12, 10, five trades. You've lost half your money. You've got to double your money to get back to where you started. 2% rule. And then the stop loss, which is a defined level at which you're comfortable with, where you exit. And if you ignore stop losses, you go bankrupt. It's just that simple. You need to have a stop loss. Now, the challenge is where? The hard part of a stop loss is where do you position it? You can just take a percentage. You can use two times ATR. There's a presentation on just one lap, a power hour from Petley Radenhase of a couple of years ago, where he talks about using the ATR for a stop loss. You can look at a chart and stick it somewhere. My advice to you is your first piece of homework, 
is to go and find 40 instruments. I don't care what they are. They can be shares, indices, commodities, currencies, 40 instruments, and say, if I were buying it today, where would I put my stop loss? Draw a line and save it. A week's time, come back to those 40 instruments and see what's happened and adjust that stop loss. You never move a stop loss down. In this example, your stop loss is nine rand. Stock goes to nine, you exit. The stock goes to 11, well, you move your stop loss to nine rand 50. Stock goes to 13, you move your stop loss to 10 rand 50 or 11. See what you're doing. You're moving your stop loss behind you. And at some point, your stop loss is actually in profit. And when you get stopped, you haven't lost money. You've now made a profit. So go and start drawing charts. Go and find stocks, indices, whatever they are. Place stops on them and then come back a week later and see have they been triggered? What was, Did it touch it and then go to the moon again? Every trader's got a story where it came down to their stop loss, they exited, and off it went without them. Sun International. I got stopped out at, I forget the price, 38, 39. Now it's running again. But my entry was 21. I'm happy with that. I made giant profits. Have I left some on the table? Yes. But at that point in time, how did I not know it wasn't going to carry on falling? How did I not know it wasn't going to collapse in a heap? I got stopped on City Lodge ages ago at about 5 Rand 10, I think it was. It went to 3 Rand 60. Stop loss is critical. It's emotionally hard because we're losing money and we're wrong. But go and practice. Just find charts, draw lines, draw stop losses. I would put it here. And then slowly you start to refine. You start to get a sense of market movement, market action, and you can start perfecting your stop losses. So that's your first piece of homework. I'm almost done here. We've got loads of time for questions in a moment. So set aside time. Speak to your family, your loved ones, your friends as to what you're doing and why you're going to be doing some time. Open a demo account. Learn the platform. Start working with charts, indicators, oscillators, trend lines. More importantly, stop losses. Just put stop losses in again and again and again. I wouldn't worry to go and check your stop losses every day. I would check them every week. So on the weekend, set aside, you've got 40 charts. So two minutes a chart is going to take you an hour and a half. Go draw your stop losses. Come back next weekend. What happened? Well, maybe it just carried on running. Well, okay, maybe you could adjust that stop loss. Maybe it's falling down. You leave the stop loss. Maybe stop loss got triggered. Then what happened? Did it trigger and run higher? Did it trigger and carry on falling? Has it triggered and gone sideways? You're learning. Critically important. Books, Trading the Zone, Mark Douglas, uh, Trend Following and the Complete Turtle Trader, it's Michael Koval. He will try and sell you black boxes. Not interested in that. I am a trend following trader. Trend Following I enjoy. Complete Turtle Trader is a brilliant book. Both well worth reading. Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, the story of Jesse Livermore. Pulled by Randomness by Nassim uh, Nicholas Tlaib. And then Van K. Tharp. Almost anything by Van K. Tharp. He's always worth his cash. So in closing, trading is easy. Making money from trading, not so easy. We're what's making it hard. Our belief in, our, in complexity, our get rich, our FOMO, our fear and greed. No one is getting rich in a hurry from trading. You've got to spend that time. You've got to watch the charts. You've got to learn the processes. Forget the noise that's out there. I am often in a trade and someone on Twitter is on the inverse trade. Uh, should I? Does it stress me? No. We're different. We have different methodologies, different processes, different time frames, different ways of doing it. Focus on the price. Focus on your process. Focus on your system. And do perfect trades. Perfect trades. Again and again. There's a ton on just one lap. Head over, find the trade uh, menu item. There's learn, there's improve, there's boot camps, there's master class, there's CFD conversations. Uh, go search for Peer 3. He's done some JC Power Hours for us on trading. And Jabul Insabundi has been writing Village Trader around his trials and tribulations of becoming a successful trader. Go and read, go watch, go listen. Go find podcasts on trading. Contact details, as always, disclaimers. 
Uh, let's do questions. We've still got about 10 minutes, so we've got loads of time. Uh, VC, how's it? Uh, student finance don't have the money to start trading, access to credit, uh, to credit to start trading. VC short on says, terrible idea to use credit to start trading. I get the why, but I'll tell you why I think it's a terrible idea, because what happens if you get some credit and you lose it, and now you just owe money and you got nothing for it? Uh, rather save up, and I appreciate that might take some time. Uh, Graham, how's it? Uh, example of a journal, do you use Excel or do I use an online one? Uh, I'm using Excel, so it's really simple. It's just uh, uh, cross and rows. The columns are uh, date, time, uh, entry, system, quantity, uh, stop loss at entry, uh, exit, and then notes because I make they'll make a lot of notes around the trade as well. There are some really good online systems and what's nice with some of them is that they integrate with some stock brokers in other words they will grab a lot of that data for you and then what they do is they start giving you uh, a p and l and 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 drawdowns and all of those sort of useful information at the same time eric moan roberts for you yo eric you're braver than me <laughs> moan roberts got some real challenges in what is a tough tough sector you know what post pandemic everyone i mean didn't Joe Biden do a trillion dollar build back better? Mm, where's it? Ain't no one seeing it anywhere. Uh, Maria covered the 2% rule. I'm assuming that question came in beforehand. Eric Erasmus, for the easy equities, does not have stop loss. Would you recommend it for trading with own capital? So you don't, that's a great question, Eric. What you're implying, what you're asking is, what you're saying is that easy equities doesn't let you put the stop loss in the system. And that doesn't particularly stress me. Now, if you're trading highly geared, highly volatile instruments, it is critically important to put it in. But if you're just trading indices, ETFs, if you're just trading some, some vanilla shares, you can action your stop loss, uh, you know, check it the day. You know, you don't need to, to be doing it full time. You can get SMS alerts. You don't necessarily need to put it in the system. I trade end of day, which means I log on and I see, oh, hit my stop loss, time to exit. So I get a little bit of slippage in my stop loss, which means my 2% rule, I actually run at a 1.5% rule. That's another whole story. But I don't necessarily need it to be baked into the system. And the nice thing about easy equities is twofold. Cheap, fractional. A lot to be said for that. Yeah, so I mean, Graham, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of moleskin. Um, although I'm trying to get fancy. I've got an iPad with an iPen, pencil, whatever they call it. Um, but you can do that as well. The trick, obviously, with electronic is that you can pull the data. And now you can start making fancy charts and the like. Uh, Bruce, I'm assuming you can offset losses against profit. Is this the case a trader should be liable for tax? Bruce, great question. So let's quickly touch on tax. If you buy and sell within three years, SARS says this is a job, this is income, therefore this is income tax. No longer capital gains, which is... 40,000 exemption per year and 40% of, 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 of your profits. And effectively, max 18% if you're in the top income bracket. In trading, you can pay whatever your income is. But yes, you offset costs. So it's a business, right? Trading, I mean, we talk about this, you know, <laughs> trading as a, as a second income. So what do we mean by that? Well, what is your income? Well, your income is your winning trades. What is your expenses? Well, your expenses are your losing trades, your brokerage, data if you're paying for that, subscription to Financial Mail and Business Day if you're paying for that, uh, a course that you go on for trading, anything in the pursuit. Think about it if you were making, if your side hustle was cakes, you know, your, your income would be sale from the cakes, but your costs would be the ingredient, uh, would be transport to the cake sale, uh, renting a stand at the cake sale. Um, uh, 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 equipment to make the cake, uh, molds and stuff. You can see I'm not much knowledgeable about cakes. Um, sometimes your cakes spoil. They don't sell and they spoil, but they're still a cost. You go in a class to learn how to become a master cake master. Again, it's a cost. They're all deductible. Keep excellent records. And just as a point, trade and invest in separate accounts because that gives nice indication to SARS because SARS always says what was your intent. Well, this is my long-term portfolio. There's my intent. My trading portfolio. There's my intent. 
Uh, Graham, what portion of income is generated by trading alone? Short answer is zero because I, 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 I still have jobs. Uh, MoneyWeb, Just One Lab, Financial Mail, uh, Standard Bank, et cetera, et cetera. So profits from trading, I don't spend it. I just roll it down into uh, uh, my long-term investing. Could I live off my trading? Um, sure, I, I, I could. I don't. Uh, it would change the mindset because it would put a different pressure into it. And I don't know what impact that would have. Um, but at this point, I, I don't live off it at all. And just a quick point on that, sort of an allied question to that is how my portfolio is constructed, kind of like a pyramid. The bottom, about 56% ETFs, about 25% long-term shares, about 10% trading equity, what I call my second tier shares. Right at the pointy is my trading. Uh, question, what about trading the OMI? So I think the OMI, A-L-M-I, is the best place to start. Go to justonelap.com, search OMI. You'll see some videos I've done there and some podcasts around it. Why? Because it's an index. It's not very volatile. Uh, you can start trading the OMI with 10,000 Rand and do proper risk management. And I know you think it's crazy, but I met someone just recently who came to a presentation I did in Cape Town in 2019, started trading OMI, um, which is basically one rand a point on the index. And now I think he's trading five Aussies, which is 50 rand a point on the index. In other words, he's completely gone. He's gone 50x in four years or so. The OMI is a great place to start your trading journey. Uh, the indicator you mentioned you should, uh, so I'm using in that case, it was exponential moving average, 7 and 21. Eddie, how long do you think you can take a person to move from conscious incompetence to unconscious, especially works daily, but is dedicated to the process of learning and experimenting both demo and funded account? It is a great question and there's no definitive answer. But even if you're working daily, if you can put aside five or six hours a week, grab some on the weekends, maybe 10 hours a week. I, I think it's something that you can get fairly efficient at within a year. I absolutely do. And particularly if you adhere to the process. In other words, because the problem is we start moving forward and we start getting much better at this and then we do some crazy stuff and it sets us back. Our capital gets decimated. Our, our, our confidence gets hurt. And we kind of, if we just, sort of dedicated to it, as you're implying in your, in, your, in, in, your, in your question there. I think this is something we can do within a year. And then, of course, you start scaling up, which is the point I made earlier as well. Uh, do I use stop loss on my tax-free investment? No. So, I mean, I have ETFs that I hold. I mean, I've got some Satrix that I first bought in December 2000. Still hold them, never sold them. So I have ETFs, which are just long-term investments, and then I have some which I trade whole different game. So my tax-free, I don't. You can trade in your tax-free. That is deeply cunning, of course. You can trade in your tax-free as much as you want. No problems, no tax. Of course, you take the money out, you can't put it back in. Which broker do you know is reasonable with their fees? I mean, ship around. I mean, so back in the day, fees were locked. I mean, easy equities is 25 points, but, you know, five is 15 points. I think markets is 25. Uh, uh, IG is 20. Uh, uh, there's lots out there that are really, really cheap. Um, but check the minimums. Because a lot of those brokers that I mentioned, they're cheap, but there's a minimum. So if you've only got 10 or 20 grand, the minimum is what's going to kill you. Uh, Brian, something just from the website, how to use technical analysis charts. There is some. Go, ship, go search for Mashima Gama, Gama, G-A-M-A. -A. Just search Gama. You'll find presentations she's done. Search for Pietri Radenhaus. You'll find what he's done as well. A fair bunch there. Uh, what platform do I use? Locally, I'm using, I mean, look, every time a new platform comes, I'll sign up. I'll try it. I've got accounts with all of them. That's just a trial and see. Uh, what am I doing? So Standard Bank is, is my primary brokerage platform, interactive brokers for my uh, offshore. But I'm still actually with HSBC and moving across to, to IB. You can use Shift even. If you just want to trade some ETFs, Shift is the app. I think it's the Standard Bank app. Buy dollars. Trade the VOO. Uh, Diane, rules on exiting and re-entering trades. Diane, that's a great and very difficult question. Um, so the short answer is when you're kicked out of a trade, forget about it. 
just re-look at that chart anew as if you'd never been in it before and wait for the setup to repeat itself. Um, I sometimes get kicked out of trades and then it carries on running and I never got another entry, but there's another one. And part of the way I hack it, let's look at my indices. So I trade S&P and NASDAQ and they broadly move the same. Why do I do that? So if I get kicked out of one, I might still be in the other. And then I trade Eurostox 50 and the UK 100. Why? Again, broadly the same. But if I get kicked out of one, I'm quite possibly still in the other. So that also helps with that point. But what I don't do, um, because of yeah, pain and suffering, notwithstanding I still have all my fingers, is say I get stopped at, say, nine rand. When it goes back to nine rand, do I rebuy? No, because my original supposition was it would go higher, and it didn't. Uh, Graham, reading list coming up. There it is there. Bashir, uh, where do we get trading systems from? So go have a look at just one lap. There's a couple there. Drop me a mail. Uh, I can send you some links to my trading systems, Lazy721. Um, and then you just start tweaking and fiddling what makes sense. Do a Google. Don't pay for a trading system, but you'll find tons on Google. There's people on TradingView who are sharing their stuff, uh, people on Twitter. Uh, template of my journal, drop me a mail, simon at just one lap.com. I will send you the email. Uh, Graham, absolute pleasure. Good to chat again. Uh, cheapest platform to start. I mean, you literally you can get down to 15 points in, in, in many cases. I mean, the key thing, perhaps uh, more than anything else, is as I said, is minimums. Watch out for those minimums. You know, there's one broker out there who seems very cheap. They zero point. I think 2%, but their minimum is 250 bucks. Uh, Eugene, recommendations for local, low-class platforms. We've been talking around that. Uh, tax implications, Diane, we touched on that. Johannes, uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Peter, back at the books. Sorry, everyone was asking that. Books again. Uh, views on trading crypto. I don't like trading crypto. It's too volatile. I hold some crypto. I just have Bitcoin. Um, I hold it in a hardware wallet. Uh, Eugene, in your experience, active trading more profitable than passive. Why should I stop buying world ETFs and leaving them as opposed to trading? It's a great point. So trading should, all things equal, be more profitable. Uh, by a factor, look, are you going to make hundreds or thousands of percents? every year consistently? No, because you'll be richer than, than whoever the richest person is right now. Um, you can do better than just a buy and hold strategy, but there's time and effort and risk. And you might look at those and say, you know what, I'm quite comfortable with my buy and hold strategy. For 98, 99% of people, just buy and hold. Uh, yeah, Benji, Fat Wallet Show as well. Great for beginners. We talk about a bunch there. Uh, once you've mastered trading, and you're halfway competent, what percentage of profits you easily make in a year? It depends, but it can just, it does depend. Um, you know, I think if you're targeting a, a uh, uh, somewhere around the 30 to 35%, which means you're almost doubling your money every year, I think you're a good trader and you're doing great. Go have a look. Richard Thompson, I think his name is on Twitter. Uh, he publishes trading data going back probably 15 years or so. And I know you're thinking 30%, I'm never going to get rich on that but it compounds, compounds very quick. Uh, how's tax managed if trade NASDAQ on WebTrader? Sean, you pay tax on your profits in South Africa, in rands. Uh, mining stocks classified as vanilla? Yo, mining stocks are volatile, but yeah, I mean, because they're ungeared, right? So 100%. Mishima Goma still trading, Graham? I actually chatted to her recently. I bumped into her in Cape Town, uh, and she is. And I keep on meaning I need to chase up with her. I want to get her get her to do some some work back in the sort of for private clients, for folks like us. Who do you follow on Twitter that has good trading advice? Uh, I actually have a list. Go look at my list, which says charts. It's not very up to date, but it's not bad. Diane, absolute pleasure uh, doing these more often. Yeah, so this will be the only one for the power hour. But if you want more of these, I'm going to do it. I want to try and do one of these every month. Go to justonelap.com, sign up for the newsletter. We'll let you know when they're happening or keep an eye on it there. We will be doing more of these. Ladies and gents, I've run my time uh, and I've answered all the questions. So I'm going to leave it there for now. I appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate all the thanks coming through. I enjoy this. 
I want to end by saying this is a journey. The purpose of this evening was never to make you a trader in a one hour and five minute presentation. That wasn't going to happen. The purpose of this evening was to help move you forward. And if something resonates with you and you're like, ah, oh, that, take it, implement it, move yourself forward. If you can take one or two things from this video, you're winning. And then watch the video again. Go watch more on just one lap and there will be tons of course on YouTube. This is a process. Engage that process, work with that process, and work to becoming that unconscious, competent trader. It is within everybody's grasp to be able to do it. Ladies and gents, have a great evening further. Look after yourself, and as always, if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.